Jim, thank you so much. I, we are so fortunate to have Jim and his family have the interest in purchasing us because I'm getting old and tired and uh, this is a perfect way to, to be able to move what has been my love on to people that I think are, are, are going to carry it forth and do a wonderful job. They have so far and it's, I'm really excited about it. Uh, to be able to, to speak to you all again about roses, I, I really like to to talk about what the, the kind of the journey has been and why I feel like these roses are so important. And that was not always the case. Um, in fact, I find it really odd that I've made a career out of growing roses because when I went to school at Texas A&M, roses were the one plant I said I'd have nothing to do with. <laughs> and so there was, there was an epiphany along the way that changed my mind. And that's kind of what I want to share with you today and maybe give you some some, some ideas or a, a little bit of credence to what went on for, for me, somebody not interested in roses, to be interested to the extent that I've made a whole life of, of trying to grow them. They aren't what I thought they were. And with that in mind, most of y'all probably have had similar prejudices about roses. Roses are these plants that have this reputation, don't they? They're, they're like, they are the queen of the flowers, but they also are the queen of fussiness, you know? That's what I was always associated with. I was a guy that graduated with the idea that I was gonna offer gardens, and easy garden landscape plants for the homeowner. And roses didn't fit into that because roses had rules. You have to spray them all the time, you have to cut them a certain way. They were prone to diseases. All these kind of things that I heard were not the kind of thing that turned me on to wanting to grow roses. So it's very interesting that uh, something happened along the way, and, and, and it happened from a, from a means of struggle. I got out of school, and I started growing Asiatic jasmine and ligustrum. <laughs> and it was back in 1976, and in 1976, Texas was booming. Right out of school, I came here to Independence where I had, my dad had purchased a house and I was going, living in that house to going to A&M back and forth. Once I got my degree, I said, I love this place. I'm going to start a nursery and grow plants for the Houston market, for Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas, because I'm right in the middle of it. I can service those people pretty easy. I said, I'm going to grow them landscape plants and deliver them and, and have a great business. And believe it or not, for two or three years, it was wonderful. Anything I rooted, sold. I went back to my wife, Jean, and I said, Jean, we're going to be rich. This is so easy. And you know how life is. It throws you a curve, and, and that wasn't necessarily the case. Back in the early 80s, I was struggling because the economy went south, and it was in a recession. Texas oil industry was hurt, the banking industry, all of that. And uh, plants were kind of a luxury item that weren't thought of as much as they were in the late 70s. And so I was left holding the bag, my banks were calling my notes, I went into deep depression, I didn't know what I was going to do, couldn't sell anything. And so I realized I have to create a niche or some, something that separates me from other growers who I was competing with. And so with that in mind, I met Lynn Lowry and Carol Abbott, people that were involved in this early onslaught, not onslaught, but this early interest in Texas native plants. They would go out into the countryside hunting for wild, uh, adapted, uh, evolved plants that, that were part of Texas' uh, uh, endemic plant life. And, and so we found penstemons and salvias and different kinds of oaks and neoponds and all these different types of plants that weren't being used in the landscape industry. And we brought those back with the idea that we could offer them as an alternative to these overused ligustrums that were being sold. And so that was just, to me, a wonderful journey, and it turned out to be a, a very, very pivotal part in my life uh, in terms of the way I looked at things. Um, we brought a lot of these native plants back. I offered plants uh, in that spirit for a while. It was a hard sell. Customers did not know what to expect from native plants, other than the fact that they're time-tested, having evolved here, they had to be better than something that we imported from, from Europe or China or anywhere else. So we knew that 
that these were a better alternative for landscape plants, but we didn't, but the customers didn't know how they responded. Didn't know how to grow them, didn't know what to expect. So it was a hard sale. And so I was still struggling for, for two to three years in the, uh, the early 80s. But what was interesting about that journey was that I was able to see for the first time roses growing in the same plants that our native plants evolved in, growing side by side. And these were not necessarily in the wild as native plants, but in abandoned home sites. <coughs> Let me go ahead and start this program. So what happened was that we would go through the countryside, we'd see some abandoned home sites, there would be a rose, some iris, an old crepe myrtle, things that survive, things that are tough. And, and so I saw roses growing there. I said, this was not what I was taught about roses. I thought roses were these fussy plants that had to, you know, had to have all this, this care. And here they were all growing without any human hands uh, for years. So this kind of was uh, interesting me. I took a cutting, brought it back to the house, grew it alongside my ligustrum. It grew and bloomed and was easy to grow. And I said, this is pretty interesting. So I continued to all of a sudden be very aware that there are very, a lot of roses that have survived that are out there in the, in the wilds, if you will. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, if you're shopping for a car and you decide you're going to get a Toyota, and so you're thinking about it, and you drive down the highway, you notice all the Toyotas because that's what's on your mind. Well, roses were on my mind, and I started finding them everywhere. One of the best places was cemeteries. And cemeteries are, are these wonderful fruit hunting grounds of what was once adored by our earlier pioneers, by our earlier settlers. And they didn't want, they didn't get the exotics. They tended to pass plants down amongst their neighbors, use the things that were strong, and in honoring the deceased would often plant their favorite plant by their headstone. And in many cases, this was a rose or an iris, uh, crepe myrtle or something like this that, that has survived. And what is interesting is the fact that most of these roses you know, uh, some of these roses, some of these plants did not survive. So I wasn't privy to the weaklings. Mother Nature had did her job for us and only been allowed for the strong to live, withstanding our blue northers that are so cold that we had this last December that just wiped out a lot of plants after plants were so lush and growing. Uh, plants that are able to take the drought, you know, six, seven months of no rain. So you're you're coming across some plants in these particular areas that are, are, are time-tested and tough. Mother Nature has done her work for, for you, and, and these are wonderful plants to, to, to bring forward. And so we started taking a look at these plants, as you can see here. So at the headstone, it says uh, uh, Mr. Thaddeus or, or Mr. Origin, uh, and it was uh, 1879 to 1918. And so there's a, there's a, a rose that is blooming beautifully, uh, most likely planted at that time and still surviving. And so this was, this was what changed my mind about looking at roses. I started bringing these cuttings from these plants home uh, with the idea that I could grow them and, and offer them as, as, as garden plants, as landscape plants, because here they are growing without any care. I have to, I have to say this, this is, uh, what, what, what I learned from other rose rustlers, they say, you know, if dead people can grow them, then anybody can. <laughs> you, know, you haven't lived until you've had some old roses. Right. There are roses to die for. Yes. <laughs> so this is, this is, this is kind of uh, a cute way of saying that the, the laws of Mother Nature are, are extremely strong with me, and I, I love gardening and growing plants and seeing the diversity that Mother Nature offers. And her laws are, are going to be here as we perish. And, and I think that we need to obey kind of what she's telling us. And when you have plants that are surviving without care, these are the kinds that you want to bring home and cultivate in your own yards. And so this is what, the, what we did. And it was, a, it was a wonderful journey. 
it set me off onto, onto things that I had no idea that I would encounter. One of my greatest joys was being able to meet these self-taught gardeners who garden the ways of their parents and of their grandparents, passing all these tendencies down. And I would meet people like, like uh, Mrs. Meyer here in Brenham. This was back in the 80s, probably mid to late 80s. And she was 92 years old. And she was an older lady at that time. Oh, well, I mean, she has to just said she's 92. Uh, a big man like me coming up to the door and knocking on the door, you expect the, the shut door treatment, you know, wouldn't answer the door. But I kind of whispered through the screen door, I was just interested in the rose in your yard that's blooming. Do you know what it is? And sure enough, she comes out and she talks to me about it. And, you know, it's, it's very, very generous. Uh, you know, you can see that my pruners are kind of hidden off to the side there. Uh, <laughs> But uh, shared cuttings, and, and, and lo and behold, you know, an hour later, you're in her backyard where all her real treasures are found. And it's that kind of generosity that I was able to encounter with going into these less affluent neighborhoods, if you will, and seeing some of the, uh, uh, the beauty of what people planted. And I, I say less affluent because a lot of times these people aren't able to keep up with the horticultural trends of the, of the modern times and go to your Walmarts and your modern stores and buy plants and bring them back, they share them. They make cuttings. And her house is full of it. She had bromeliads and tomatoes and all this kind of stuff on her porch. You can see them in pots there. And so she's this self-taught horticulturist who gardens away of her parents, passing these plants down, and it's just a wonderful journey to be able to talk to people like this. And this <clears throat> indeed was one way that I got some cuttings of roses that I knew were, weren't modern, were very, very old. She said that this red rose, let's see if I have a picture of it, no. She said that this red rose was a rose that her mom grew. That dates that rose over 100 years old. Well, I was able to get a picture of this rose and buy this rose, or buy a rose that looked like this rose from Peter Beals. Peter Beals was an English nurseryman in England. And he sent me this rose, and I said, it looks just like this rose in the catalog. I want to grow it side by side and see that. Sure enough, it was the same rose. Turned out to be a rose called Louis Philippe. And Louis Philippe was a rose that was brought over by Lorenzo de Zavala when he was a minister to France when Texas was a republic. And he had his garden in Lynchburg, Texas, and, uh, and, and grew some of these roses that the French shared with him as gifts. And, and the French at the time were the people that were distributing a lot of these roses. They were breeding roses. They were making the, bringing China roses from China and tea roses from England. And that was the way our pioneers essentially brought a lot of these roses into their homestead. Uh, you've heard stories about people going across the, the West carrying and cutting of a rose in a potato because the potato would nurse the cutting until they got, had time to plant it in their own garden. There's wonderful stories. We're in a place that is rich with horticultural history. We are in really the center of Texas horticulture. Uh, Thomas Affleck, a nurseryman, uh, uh, William Watson, all of them started right here, and, and this was the hub of the national distribution of horticultural information. Many of these people went on from here to be the curators at Harvard and places like that later, later on. So, Texas, at this particular place, was always a hotbed, was already a hotbed, because this is where all the major players in Texas history were living at the time. And so it was a perfect, a perfect place for us to kind of rediscover some of these, these roses. So uh, I just uh, loved Maddie for her, I mean, loved uh, Mrs. Meyer for her sharing and her ability. And this is where I was able to get many cuttings of other roses that I didn't know of that we started garden started growing. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is of Maddie Breedlove. And Maddie Breedlove lives in Old Washington. And uh, what is interesting about this picture is not only the rose at her foot, which turned out to be a rose called Maggie, which is rose found by Dr. William Welch, who named it after his mom's uh, grandmother in Louisiana, because he found that rose in Louisiana as well. So here's a rose that we found in different locations, have since found it in Puerto Rico, in Bermuda, in different places. So we know it was introduced as a rose of name 
but it was probably back in the eight, late 1800s. And being out of commerce, there was no more, uh, no more distribution of the name. Nobody kept the name. And so we don't know what the real name of the rose is. Now we look at literature and we see things that look like it, like Eugene de Marley. That's one of the names that they're thinking that Maggie might be, which dates that rose earlier than the 1800s. Bruce uh, and Tepletz is another idea it might be. But we're not for sure, so we continue to sell that rose under its found rose name, Maggie. And uh, just a, a beautiful story that she has here. But what I love about this picture is not only did she pass plants down this, roses and stuff this way, but she also passed down the culture of her heritage. Being from Africa, earthen swept yards were so important because they would keep the grass from encroaching on their house which harbored snakes and varmints and rats and things, and uh, were also a fire hazard. So they would sweep the yard. Earth and swept yards were so important to uh, the African heritage. And here we have that brought forth in central Texas from this lady, and it was just a marvelous uh, guard to, to walk around. Uh, I was really fortunate to be called by William Ellis, who was an associate editor of National Geographic. And he said he was, good, he was going to do an article called The Gift of Gardening. This was back, I think, in the early 90s. And some of the gardens, uh, his, he said he wanted to talk to me about this little uh, this thing that's going on called Texas Rose Rustling. And so he came and he interviewed. And I said, the real person you need to meet is, is Maddie. And so he went and spoke with Maddie. And he had a, a, a section in the article about her, about her being bitten by a rattlesnake about her being behind scars behind her collarbone from being behind horse and plow. All these wonderful stories that, of the hardships of gardening, but yet uh, the love of gardening. And uh, she, she, he ended the, the statement with a saying that she says, she says, you know what keeps me alive is, is my, my desire to come out and, and, and sweep the yard every day. And so it's that kind of love of gardening that I think is, is a, was a perfect uh, example of what he was wanting for uh, from a Texas rose rust. So this was a, a, great, uh, a great story. And this is what started happening to me right at a time when I was trying to struggle and try to find a plant that I could offer. Uh, this is also another little story. It just is so perfect and so picturesque of, of, a, of, a, of a process that has happened for years with people in gardening uh, that I really, I think, expresses the love of gardening. This lady is in Navasota. And I was passing by, hunting for my roses as usual, and I saw this, this rosemary with all these rocks around it. And I walked up there, and she was out in the yard working, and we started talking, and I realized that what she was doing was that she had this rosemary plant that she has loved for about eight years. The rosemaries typically don't live that long. They'll freeze or rot or something. But she's had it for that long and was very enamored with it, loved to cook with it, and it was also uh, fragrant in her yard. And, and so she was talking about her love of it, and she says, you know what I do every year? I get a big bucket, or several big buckets, fill them, fill them up with some potting soil, stretch the branches of the rosemary across the top of the bucket, get a big rock and crush that branch into that bucket. Come back about two to three months, remove the rock because that branch has rooted into that bucket. She cuts it away from the mother plant. She says, I have my time-loved rosemary to give to my daughters and to my neighbors. And this is a way that plants are, are, are shared. So it's a wonderful tribute to the way people love and, and grow plants. What happened to me was all of a sudden I became an advocate of roses. We were bringing all these roses home. I had no idea what the names of them were. I knew, uh, knew where they were found. I knew that we had an Old Gay Hill Cemetery red rose. So that's the name of it. I, I knew that we had Highway 290 pink buttons. And we found it on Highway 290. I knew we had roses like what was it, San Marcos Red. Uh, we had uh, lots of found roses. And interesting enough, these found roses slowly but surely became actual roses that were introduced. And that was a wonderful story because as we did literature, as people looked at our roses and said, this, this, Archduke Red, this, this uh, San Marcos Red rose that you have looks just exactly like Archduke Charles introduced out back, I think, in the 1840s. And so some of these roses that we gave them found names turned out to be roses that were introduced 
and I learned that they were true old garden roses. And um, roses that were introduced before 1867. And that's when the first hybrid tea rose was introduced. And that's why uh, you have a division between hybrid teas and old garden roses based on, on that. So uh, these were defining had fragrance. And I'm not just talking about rose fragrance. I'm talking about a nuance of hundreds of different types of fragrances. From banana cream pie to hot pepper to true damaged perfume. Roses are incredible in the array of fragrances. And to grow a rose without a fragrance, I think, is a tragedy. Because roses and fragrance are the memory, and having memories also creates the emotion. So many times have I seen people in the garden smell roses and feel like they're being attacked by some sort of emotion. I remember fondly when I planted Cecil Bruner, the climbing Cecil Bruner rose, our sweetheart rose. We planted it on the, on the, uh, next to the corn crib up there. First year, right after our ribbon cutting, we had that rose about six to eight feet tall. It was in full bloom. An elderly lady walked up to that rose, smelt it, turned around to me, and with tears in her eyes said, I haven't smelt this rose for 30 years. This was my grandmother's rose. That in itself is a vehicle of fragrance that is so important to, to plants and flowers. So fragrance is, is incredibly important. I know we're going to continue this here. We're going to have a fragrance gallery. And that's where we pick roses from the field, put them in little vases with water, have the names on a table. People will walk up and down and look at the roses, see the name, smell them, and then establish that relationship where once you've smelled it, you'll, you'll be transferred back in time once you once smelled it before, or create a new, new memory in the future. Uh, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I remember it, it actually, uh, I, say, I say fragrance sometimes defeats common sense. Let me explain. We'll have people smelling these roses and they'll smell one and they'll stammer and do all this other stuff and hunt for a piece of paper in their, in their pocket and a pen and write down the name of the rose, rush over to the nursery and try to find it where there'll be two left, all of them which have been trampled because people have been buying so many of them and yet they'll still buy it because they want that fragrance. It means so much to them to go back and have that memory imprinted in their mind. So fragrance trumps common sense. You wouldn't normally buy a rose that's been trampled <laughs> or been picked through. So it's a very important aspect. So fragrance is really one key thing about these old roses that is so, so important. Another attribute, which is, I think, almost equally important because it evokes the creativity in everyone here, and that is the diversity of form. That means kind of an unusual statement, but what it means is, unlike the hybrid tea roses that were bred to be these upright soldiers, so you can put them in rectangular prisons that we call rose gardens, you know, so that you can you can kind of see and compare the flowers. Old roses don't belong in rose gardens. Every one of them is, is very diverse. You would be perplexed by the array of shapes and sizes of planting old roses in a rose garden. It doesn't work. Rose, the diversity of these roses being climbers and, and small leaves and, and all the different kinds of shapes that you get, um, indicate or, or dictate to me a means by which you, the garden artist out there, would plant them in your own yard, to mix them on the fences, to mix them into, into the borders, to plant other plants with them, to embellish the architecture of your home. They beg you to use them in a way that they are growing. And so that makes them true, ultimate garden plants. They have fragrance, and they have the ability to be so many different forms, and you just have to discover those forms as you learn and walk around and see how these roses grow, on how you would use them in your own yard. They tell you how to be used. In, in, in saying that, they have told me that for 40 years since I've been walking through these gardens. And as I did that, I realized that some of the roses were saying, why in the heck did you plant me here? 
you know how I don't belong here. I belong over there with that companion of plants over there and the color palette works better and, and I have more sunlight over there or this and that. And it's kind of like the roses had this moxie of saying, Mike, use me properly, you know? Use me in a different way. Be creative. And so I started looking at this and I realized that these roses were so incredibly diverse and different that they actually kind of have a personality. And so I wrote a book called Empress of the Garden, which delves into the personality, if you will, of these roses. Now, that's kind of a corny way to personalize or personify roses, but, but they really do have, have uh, indications or tendencies. Uh, anybody have ever grown mermaid yes. or Cherokee? Yes. They tend to grow, don't they? We, we call those roses, those wild roses that grow with wild abandonment, like Peggy Martin, that grow beyond the means by which you could control them. We call them the, the um, what do we call them, Jane? I forgot the name. Monsters? <laughs> Monsters. Uh, they're, per, they're, they're, they're divas. I mean, they're, they're, they're empresses, but they have, I can't believe it, went blank on the name I called them. But, uh, but they have that typical wild takeover personality. We have other roses like uh, Old Blush and Moisei Superior and Duche that are, I call them uh, stay-at-home moms. Now, they're empresses too, and you plant them, but they are so strong, so sturdy, anchors of the garden, just like moms are, where you can do, plant them and forget about them. They're gonna be beautiful, do their thing, not be worrisome in any way to allow you to do other things in the garden. So there's that type. We have the beautiful roses that are noisettes that climb and ramble, uh, and we call them the romantic climbers. And, and, and that personality is, is so beautiful with the noisettes because they climb up pillars and their stems are so weak that the flowers hang down. So when the rose is in full bloom, it looks like that particular pergola or, or pillar is dripping with these roses. Fragrance is outstanding. So we have those, we have the rose divas. These are roses that when you walk into the garden and if they happen to be in bloom, they say to you, don't you dare look at any other rose in the garden. I'm the only thing that's worth looking at right now. And roses like that are your souvenir de la Song, some of your roses that are so, so spectacular. They are specimens in the garden. So this, this whole thing about personality is, was, was, a, was, a, was a tool for me to realize that you can kind of print a, a, and talk about these personalities and it allows you, the garden artist out there, to be able to try to integrate them into your garden using those tendencies. And so it's, it was another epiphany, if you will, to go through that. So diversity of form and fragrance. Those two things you don't get with the hybrid tea roses. Hybrid teas, I'm not, you know, bad now. Hybrid tea roses are the show quality roses. They're the roses that you give away because they're a perfection. They win best of show, but they're grown in greenhouses by specialists in trying to, to develop roses for their perfection. They're not garden roses. No matter what you do, if you go back outside and, and buy some hybrid tea roses, and you go home and you're a great gardener, no matter what kind, what kind of effort or cultural genius you are, after two to three years, those roses decline. It's not your fault. It's the fact that these roses have been so inbred to be only grown for the perfect flower, not to grow in your yard. Old roses, being time-tested, found in cemeteries and older home sites, are truly the kind of roses that you have in your yard that you can just plant and forget about. Not forget about so much, but not fuss over like you would the hybrid teas. So therein lies the difference. Fragrance and diversity of form. True garden qualities that are remarkable in the old roses. This is what you get when you get roses mixed with other plants. You want to plant them with companions, with perennials, with other, with other plants. And this is the beauty, grasses and different types of upright spiky things are beautiful as, as in context with these roses. I was really fortunate to be able to go to Sissinghurst 
which is a garden in East London, Southeast London, uh, that was developed by Vita Sackville West. And uh, she and her husband, and his, his name was Sir Harold Nicholson, and he was the architect. And he built these walls that were perfectly perpendicular and straight, with the walkways all exactly parallel. Everything was just, the hardscape was just perfect. And then you had her walking along throwing seeds over her shoulder. So it was the interpretation of this casual, wonderful garden expression with the hardscape that makes those gardens so wonderful. But what's really remarkable about those gardens is the fact that she had roses everywhere, but no rose gardens, just gardens that have roses in them. And it was beautiful the way that she would mix things. And you would never think of the mixtures. It made me think of a saying. He says, you know, your neighbors are going to talk about you anyway, so you might as well plant whatever you want to plant and be, and be the license of your own, own, own success there. And, and I love the fact that Vita was that way. So as you walk along the garden, you would see roses blooming uh, next to each other uh, with a big flat onion that is in, in full bloom right next to it. And so it gave contrast and made everything show out and be beautiful. So that's also a, a, a lesson. And here you see uh, our fragrance gallery, as I mentioned earlier, where we walk along the tables. Individuals can smell these roses, be transformed to when they had smelled them before, or, or create a memory for the future. Uh, fragrance is such an important aspect of this. Here's a picture of our garden and many years ago, showing you the, the interplay of perennials and roses and all the native plants mixed with the hardscape. And it's, and it's a very doable thing. It's all very, very approachable. So we have, within that diversity, we have wonderful shrubs like you see here. Anybody out there fertilizing any of those? No, it's because they recycle. Mother Nature recycles the leaf litter down to the soil level. The microbes eat that leaf litter and the compost and the, and the, and the barks and everything. And in so doing, release all the minerals, all the, all the different important ingredients that make bigger plant forms grow. So mulches are fertilizers. So we mulch essentially two times a year. And the reason why, we can put three to four inches of mulch on the ground, come back and six months later, look at it and scratch it, and how much mulch is there? None. It's almost gone. And have you ever gone down and scratched the earth and, and seen where the, the bark meets the soil? Oh my gosh, what a, what, a, what a pool of life is going on there. roly polies, white mycelium, all kinds of life is going on. That life is the sustenance of all bigger life forms. It, it is, releases uh, fertilizers in the exact ratios that plants use them. Instead of us getting a 13, 13, 13 and, and applying it, you end up with extra phosphorus that gets in our groundwater. You get into uh, uh, overabundance of certain fertilizers that then the, the plants, uh, the, the pH and stuff can't utilize other micro, micronutrients. So it, it can mess things up by using our synthetic fertilizers. Mother Nature knows how to do it in perfect ratios. And so that's how we want to always embellish what is naturally given to us. And so this is very, very important to uh, I feel like in the organic approach to, to gardening with this. Use mulches. They, they can feed your roses. Now when you first plant a rose, you'll want to embellish the soil with compost. Compost is the byproduct of what mulch was after it's been processed by the microbes. So it's full of, of, uh, of microbes ready to react with your, your soil. It's neutral. It's not going to rob nitrogen and it's continuing to break down. You never want to put mulch in the soil. You can want to put compost in the soil and mix it with your soil. Plant into that mixture, come on top with the mulch afterward, and you've got a garden, no matter if you're growing a tomato or herb or a rose. It's a wonderful way to, to do it. Uh, so, I'm going to show you just a, a flash of a, a few pictures that we're very proud of here that we're going to be offering. Uh, Nathan is back there and, I, I, and, and, and company. And what we have done is we've created a lot of pioneer roses, a lot of roses that we have bred with the idea that we are bringing the best of old garden roses forward with roses that have maybe even more evocative fragrance and flower form and diversity that can be even better in some cases than some of the old roses. 
Our tagline will be always that we are bringing back and redistributing old roses. But when we can breed, bringing old roses back into the, into the mix with beautiful flowers and fragrance, that's what we're doing. So roses to look for in the future will be fragrant blush, grand baby. Some of these are available. Wicked Sister, Femme Fatale, Thousand Wishes, Magnolia Memories, Butterfly Bliss, Southern Sweet Tea, Wild Acantis, Royal Sunrise, which is a beautiful rose, comes out yellow, turns purple as it ages. Very interesting. Ray Ponton, our, our, our fellow rose rustler, uh, who passed away. Uh, this rose is named after him, uh, purchased by the rose rustlers, or, or given to the rose rustlers, I would say. And so, this is what it's all about, is having a beautiful garden mixed with these old roses, native plants, perennials, annuals, and, and, and other shrubs. Uh, as, as an example of what roses can do in a garden. And uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a, a love of joy to do this within the, this. So we want you to have your cake and eat it too. This is a, this is a sweetheart rose with red cascade as the center. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, plant. And I just love the idea that we're passing these plants on. And I'm going to use a story that Felder Russian told me, uh, and some of you may have heard this before, but I just love it and I feel like it encapsulates what gardening is all about. And that is that when Felder was at a talk similar to this, he had a daughter who was about seven or eight years old and he was telling the audience, he says, now, uh, what I did is I told Zoe, that was her daughter, to go out in the backyard, because there was a rose bloom back there. And he says, Zoe, I want, you to, I want you to stand by that rose, I want to get your picture. And so he went and got his camera, at the time there was film in the camera, and, and he pretended to take her picture over and over again. He says, no, Zoe, I didn't get a good one. Here, stand behind it and, and smell the rose, and I'll take a picture doing that. He says, you know what I'm doing? He says, you know, 30 or 40 years from now, I'll probably be dead or gone. She's going to come across this rose in somebody's yard. She's going to smell it, and we'll be back together again. <laughs> That's what gardening is all about. And I think it's so important that we carry that message through, that we garden for what is fun and what is memorable, not because of the rules, but because you can be creative and you can enjoy these plants. We've got the perfect roses here for that, and uh, I love being with you all. Thank you very much.